Steve Mozan, mm -hmm. one of our mutual friends, yeah. uh, a guy here who I met through CNU, um, got in a squabble with some people about just architectural style. Yeah. And I'll say the squabble came down to this. Uh, we should build housing no matter how obnoxious, how uh, ugly, how like inhuman it is because it's inhuman to not have enough housing. Yeah. I think I get that point, right? Right. Like I get that point. Like if you don't have, if you're homeless, if you don't have housing, if you can't afford the housing you're in, maybe architectural style is not the thing you're worried about. Right, right. Yeah. Steve's argument, and this is an argument that I'm probably more sympathetic to, is that it's not hard to build stuff that is actually respectful right. of a place, of yeah. people. Uh, it, it provides people with dignity. It, 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 it is not, it is actually easier to build that and build it at scale right. than it is to build hideous stuff yeah. that like finances well, but yeah. really doesn't respect humans. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're, those two groups were kind of talking past each other yeah. and I think not recognizing the other's valid motivation. Right. The one motivation was, we have people who are homeless, let's get housing built. Yeah. And like, yes, agreed. Steve's was, we can do that and do it with dignity for people. Right. And it's actually easier to do it and do it that way than it is to do it with these monstrosities that are really ultimately financial products yeah. more than they are housing. Yeah. Yeah. So very cool. This, this facility that we see down here uh, in front of us is uh, the roller rink. In the wintertime, uh, I understand this is an ice, sink, uh, ice rink. I wonder if so, it was the last winter. We didn't even get we yeah. didn't even get an ice skating rink at my house this you, last winter. You, you have had, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, there you go. You haven't been to my new house, but mm -hmm. a block and a half from my house, they build a really nice ice skating rink. Yeah. And uh, you know, we go all the time. We yeah. go Christmas Eve, we go New Year's Eve. Yeah. We have a big we have a party in January where we bring the whole family over and we all go ice skating. Yeah. None of that happened this year. Yeah. So I wonder if they did, because this, when we, I have to confess, mm -hmm. when we walked around here, I'm like, ooh, they have an ice skating rink? And then it, like, no, they don't in yeah. May, you idiot. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, but I can see where they would. Yeah, like, it'd be really nice. nice. I'm, I'm sure if it is a warmish winter, there's probably an awful lot of, of energy trying to uh, keep yeah. it ice and, yeah. and make it uh, happen. Yeah. You'd and all have that. to spend a lot to do yeah. that here. But it would be, I mean, it would be really great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this would be a fun, um, they've segmented it up enough where you, it, it's, it's, it can be a gathering space for a lot of people. It yeah. can be a gathering space like today for not that many. You're right. And so I think it could work both ways. I think in the evening too, I've noticed in the last few evenings that this has been very vibrant. There's been lots of people here. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we did have the, the Strong Towns National yeah. Gathering spillover yeah. CNU opening party here last night. Yep. Um, so the title of your book? Escaping the Housing Trap. Yeah. The Strong Towns. I, 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 I can't remember the subtitle. The subtitle, yeah. It's not. I know it's not solution because the publisher wanted solution and we said no. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the Strong Down's approach to the housing crisis. And I, and I know that you have had that discussion. I think it's even in the book. No, no, about, it's in the book. I ripped uh, the publisher this, in the book. Yeah, the, 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 the solution is like, we're not about huh. prescribing yeah. solutions. Yeah. So we, we were, before we hit the record button, we were talking about you know, some of the traditional development patterns and the, the architecture that we're looking at. This is also some of the architecture that over the years, and you talk about this in the book, became illegal. Yeah. Well, all of this down here would have been illegal at some point. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like this is the easiest to understand when it comes to schools. Mm -hmm. uh, we went out in the 19... 50s and the 1960s and we looked at where the most successful schools were right. and they were where all the rich people had moved to right. and built these massive school campuses out in the suburbs right. and then we said you know what makes a successful school mm -hmm. it's not the families it's not the people it's not the community it's not all the you know did you read to your kid when they were three mm -hmm. 
Do you know what makes a great school? Having enough parking, having enough athletic fields, having big enough classrooms, yeah. having, and so we, we, we took it as engineers, as architects, as planners, and we reduced success down to a, a geometric proportions. Right, right. Then we went back into the city and we said, if you're gonna build a school in the city, right. here's the proper geometric proportions to have success. Right. And so if you're gonna have an urban school, you need to tear down every building around it yeah. to create this geometric proportion. Right. Okay, we did the same thing here with these places. <laughs> yeah, it's like exactly. if you're gonna have a barber shop, yeah. here's what a barber shop needs in yeah. terms of setback, right. in terms of floor area ratio, yeah. in terms of parking, yep. in terms of stormwater runoff. This is the optimum. Right. And the optimum was made artificially really right. from what like success was yeah. in those early kind of suburbanization days yeah, yeah. and so they would have gone in and you would have said every single building here is illegal right. is non-conforming uh, if you want to change uses if you want to add on if you want to do anything to the building you will need to go through an extensive process to right. do that yeah, yeah. and so what happened was uh, the land values here dropped for, for, for many reasons, that was one of them, the fact that what was on it became illegal. The other one was, you know, we just made a lot of land available. Land in the center of cities used to be really, really valuable because mm -hmm. that was the most accessible land. Right, yeah, yeah. When you take the automobile and you spread cities out and make everything accessible, right, yeah. the actual value of the land drops. Yeah. And so these great buildings, which, which are the culmination of many generations of iterating. So this is definitely not the first building that was built in this spot. It was right. probably the third or maybe the fourth building. Right, yeah. You would have had a little shack, you would have had a, a, a slightly bigger like wood building, mm -hmm. then you would have gotten something that would have been concrete. But you worked up to these buildings, right? Yeah. Like this would have been a more mature version of what was here. By the yeah. time you, you get to that, uh, now they're made illegal they made so you can't renovate them, and you've got this substantial thing on a lot that is not worth as much, yeah. a lot of them were just torn down. Yeah. Yeah. And just torn down, not to even make way for something else, but a yeah. lot of times they just tore them down to avoid the taxes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this building, no one wants this building, you can't do anything with it, yeah. it's been made illegal, so we're just gonna tear it down. Yeah. And you would end up with uh, abandoned buildings next to empty parking lots, and all of it brought about by regulation and finance. All right. Thank God in places like this, they didn't tear them down. Yeah, completely. It's funny because the cities today that are, I think, best positioned and most successful, uh, best positioned to be the most successful, right. are the ones that urban renewal, they were too broke during urban renewal to yeah. do it. And I think that that is part of the narrative here. That's part of the narrative here, is that the, the world had kind of passed them by and so by the time you get to the 1950s and 60s, they, they couldn't at scale like rip everything down. Right, right. Uh, so now that we're rediscovering the value of these things, yeah. they still have some of it. Yeah, yeah. Chuck, so okay. uh, welcome back to the Active Towns podcast on the Active Towns channel. We're in Cincinnati, Ohio. We just finished up the Strong Towns National Gatherings. CNU has kicked off. And uh, we were just pausing uh, back there at Court Street and looking at the roller rink. Also serves as a, uh, an ice skating rink in the winter time. We're gonna be talking a little bit about your book, but we also wanna just kind of, you know, maybe reflect on the built environment that we see, because I think that a lot of the strong town's messages and a lot of the things that you talk about in the book, we're gonna see as we walk through uh, this space here. Thanks, John. Yeah. It's nice to be, you and I have done a lot of things together over the years. It's always fun to hang out and to chat. I have been to Cincinnati a number of times. Yeah. Uh, that means I've seen a tiny fraction of it. Right, yeah. <laughs> what part of the, the blessing that my life is. Yes. So when I go to a city, people take me and show me things, yes. yeah. but oftentimes they want to show me their horrible Strode yeah. and their strip mall that's failed. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, I know, like yeah. we all have this. <laughs> it's like someone brings you to their house, they have to show you the, the, the furnace in the basement and the, uh, the you know, the, here's the our- The wiring that's no yeah. longer working. Exactly, here's, here's the old transformer. Yeah. Um, but I don't often get to see, I mean, sometimes get to see this stuff. I don't often get to see 
the the little intricacies that I enjoy. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes I can strike out on my own, but usually they overschedule me. Yeah. Th this is, um, it's interesting here because you have this space that is uh, wide and overly vacant. Like it, it, it feels a little empty. They've, they've tried to make up for that uh, with the tree line median, which is very nice. I mean, it does add a lot. If you didn't have that, this would be really barren. Yep. It didn't feel uncomfortable to cross here, although you could tell it was, it was not as pleasant a space as otherwise would. And you've got these corners with these gaps, two little parking lots. And I mean, ideally you would get something in those to square off those corners and really kind of make this place more prominent. But in the absence of that, I don't know what this mural is. It's funny to me. I don't know if it means something more than, than comedy to the people of Cincinnati, um, but it's cute. Uh, that one is remarkable. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, you're, you're, I'm sure someone uh, who has more artistic taste than me would say, you know, you're, you're recreating some Roman thing in, in a cheesy way. Yeah. Uh, Cincinnatus, there we go. Yeah. But I, uh, I like it. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to have a vacant spot like that, the idea that you, you paint it up and you make it so that as you're walking down the street, especially with how nice this street is, yeah. what you're really trying to do is get the people who are here to be willing to cross this gulf, yeah. right? Right. This, yeah. this, this, uh, you know, this gulf in your city to continue on that way, yeah. and that is a, that's a beautiful, beautiful way to do it. And if I remember correctly, and and I, I could be off on this, but Central Parkway, uh, again, it's this is a monster. I mean, we're we're talking four lanes, you know, one parking lane and three travel lanes. Uh, when the cars are going fast in the morning at commute time, you, you're like, wow, yeah, this is very uncomfortable. But I believe that this is where the canal was. I believe that oh, this really? was where what okay. they called the Rhine, because yeah. uh, this, this district that we're going into is uh -huh. OTR, over the Rhine. Oh. And you see the branding on the, on oh, the, uh, the banners yeah, here, yeah. OTR, over the Rhine. And so I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe that this is where yeah. the, the, the canal was that was part of that. And so it's a little bit of the legacy, a little bit of the history. Yeah. Shows you, it, the canal cities, we, it's, it's hard to get our brains around it. Yeah, yeah. But the idea yeah. that you would bring in like a bunch of supplies by canal, and yeah, that, that yeah. would be the easiest way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very yeah. cool. Yeah, very cool. Well, and I guess the other part of the history of the city, and we'll see some of this as we walk, is uh, very much agricultural and animal processing. So you'll see the flying pig uh, marathon banners yeah. up. Yeah. And so pigs are very much a, a part of the city. And so you'll see all sorts of porcine uh, statues and, and legacy. Uh, and it was primarily a, a German settlement. So everything that we're walking through here, uh, and I think a, a couple blocks over is, uh, is a beautiful old building that literally says German National Bank. No kidding. Yeah, huh. pretty pretty fascinating. Huh, I was, um, that that is interesting. You know, th this part of the world uh, was not, not easy to grow things in. It was not as easy as some of the places further east mm -hmm. and further south, yeah. but it was very accessible by water. Right. And so you did have a lot of the early development here be yeah. driven by the, the, the kind of wa what can you get to a riverway right. and then what can you get to a major city yes. and that drove the economics of a lot of this. Yeah. Do you know the story of Cincinnati? I don't know the entire story, no. Yeah. I don't know the entire story yeah. Yeah. but I know that Cincinnati was a Roman leader mm -hmm. who in, in Rome they were worried about having an absolute ruler which right. is crazy because that's what they ultimately ended up with, right? right? right. Yeah, yeah. But they were worried about the this. Of yep. yeah. And so they would have uh, consuls who yep. would rule on opposite days, mm -hmm. two people who essentially shared power. Right. Um, but in times of crisis, they would give kind of absolute power to someone. Yeah. The barbarians are at the gate. Yeah. We're going to give power to you to solve this. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So Cincinnati was one of these we'll rulers talk about that, in a second. Yeah. that they gave yeah. absolute power to. Yeah. And the reason he is celebrated, and the reason he is celebrated here in the United States, mm -hmm. is because he was the model that our founding fathers wanted to everybody to emulate. Right. Because when the crisis was over, he gave up power right. and went back to his farm. Ah, there you go. And so George Washington 
actually was modeling right. the behavior of Cincinnatus. When he finished two terms as president, right. he could have run again. Right. He uh, is widely believed he would have been elected and sure. they wanted to make him king, right? right? They wanted yeah. to make him like ruler for life. Yeah. And he said, no, we are of the people. And Cincinnatus was the person that he tried to elevate and they tried to elevate as yeah. the role model for how our politicians should act. Give up power. And, and so this city itself, Cincinnati, is kind of named in that, in that legacy. Right, yeah. And it was an early enough American city where you were still um, grasping at that kind of founding vision, right? right? right. I think if we, if we founded a brand new city today, we would name it Kardashian or something. We wouldn't, <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be Cincinnatus. I, I, I have a soft spot for that vision because yeah, it's, yeah. it's a beautiful one. It is a beautiful vision. So uh, we saw um, uh, an electric uh, bike uh, zoom yeah. past us here yeah. and rocking his music, which was kind of cool. Uh, we're also poised right here in front of a really cool bike shop that has yep. uh, some great cargo bikes. And I didn't notice that. Uh, this little gray bike right here is the Turn GSD. That's my grocery bike. That's I what I it. use. Yeah, that's what I use. Yeah. Nope, the one, the gray one. I like that. What is this? That's an Urban Arrow. Yeah, but like, you just put a kid in there or something? Yeah. Okay. So those get configured. You can do them this for is cargo. The one you take to go get groceries? Yeah. So yeah. you don't put a kid seat on the back? I don't have a kid seat. I have uh, an adult seat in the back, Two. and so Laura can jump on the back. Okay and uh, we can but do this that. Is, this is electric power, so you get a little electric oomph. Electric assist. And you can take yeah. uh, electric assist. Yeah, yeah, electric assist, so uh, there's no throttle. Yep. Electric assist, so it gives you a little boost getting up uh, the steep hills mm -hmm. uh, to my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's been a car replacement for us. You know, oh, yeah. we, we're, we remain car light and uh, uh -huh. are able to do a heck of a lot of stuff <laughs> because a little bit of a, an electric assist. Yeah. And this is really, I think, the, the key is that if we can work on transforming our built environment, our cities, to becoming more bike friendly so that you know, somebody doesn't have to ride on the sidewalk to yeah. feel safe, yeah. uh, this starts becoming a legitimate car replacement. There's a couple of points in your book where you literally talk about how important it is for us to you know, create more housing within reasonable walking and biking distance and uh, adjacent to transit so that we can cut our you know, dependency yeah. on automobiles yeah. everywhere all the time. It is, um, I, I think the way that I think about it is in terms of like liberating a family, yeah. liberating a, a, a household uh, to be able to have more of their resources right. to spend on other things. Yeah. So if you can live in a neighborhood, and really if, if we're gonna, there's a yin and yang here because if, if we're gonna have broadly affordable housing, right. we have to build a lot more. A lot. A lot more. Yeah. We're never gonna build a lot more in like the big drop it in kind of style. Right. It will never keep up with what we need. Yeah. Building single family homes on the edge yeah. is choking our communities. Yeah. These things are not options. Yeah. So when you take the options that don't work off the table, the thing that we have to focus on is building a lot of small units yes. in existing neighborhoods. Right. When, yeah. you, when you recognize that, you recognize that that will change the dynamic of a neighborhood, yeah. right? Yeah. It, 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 it will make the idea of everybody having two cars and driving everywhere really hard to do. Right. There, there won't, oftentimes we hear when people wanna build housing like this, where are they gonna park? Right. And I think a lot of people who advocate for that will just dismiss that, like, oh, stop worrying about that. Yeah. And I agree, we're way too sensitive about where people are gonna park. Yeah. But the reality is that that is gonna be an issue. Yeah, yeah. The way you get over that is you start to build corner stores yeah. and you know, grocery stores closer and places where you can work that are closer to where you live. Exactly, yeah. When we say closer, if the only two options on the table are, are walk uh, or drive, close for walk is you know, 10 blocks, right? Yeah, right? I walk six blocks to work, it's easy walk. A few more would still be easy, but you're starting to get beyond the point where it's super easy, right? right. Um, if you drive, driving five miles is in, not in not in where you live, yeah. <laughs> not in Austin, yeah. but in Brainerd is like super easy. Yeah, yeah. But um, well, know. I can tell you this: uh, since you brought up Austin, yes, I'm based in in South Austin. 
I can make my way up to the Miller neighborhood, which is where uh, we have, you know, the 20-year the build-out of a new community. Yeah, we're going to cross yeah. the street here. Um, so that, that route, that ride for me to go up to the Miller neighborhood, yeah. which is where uh, Preston, our good oh, friend yeah, Preston yeah. Tyree, yeah. lives. And um, that's about, yeah, that's about seven and a half miles. Mm. And so your the majority. Your, your electric assist that. Yeah. yeah. And so the majority of that um, that ride for me when I make that trip to to go up there because I love documenting that community. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you why in a second. The I have access to an entire network of safe and inviting, highly comfortable pathways mm -hmm. to make my way there, including just beautiful pathways through parks. Mm -hmm that then connect to uh, the Red Line Trail Parkway that goes right along the, the, the transit line. Mm -hmm. And it's just absolutely you know, delightful to be able to yeah. do that. Yeah. The other day I took a, uh, the transit or the, the traffic advisor for the city of Harlem in the Netherlands yeah. was in town visiting really? and I okay. took him on a tour of that. Not sheepishly? Not sheepishly, and and he and we hey, look, bike infrastructure. Yeah, we we created five videos from oh, that because really? I interviewed him the whole time. Yeah. we created five videos, and he critiqued everything as we were going. Oh, nice. And at the end, he's just like, "Yeah, you guys are doing some really good stuff here. Keep it up." And to your point, it gives mobility options. It gives. In fact, let's let's stop here for just a second. Um, the, I'm staying right here. Oh, really? So that's my Airbnb right up there. With the, with the yeah, here. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The Taste right. of Belgium uh, building there. Oh, I like it. And so, if somebody is a, a young professional, a, a young family is living in this neighborhood, mm -hmm. and they're able to find a job in this neighborhood too, they can literally exist car free, right. easily. I can totally see how that can happen in this area. Well, if you have a bike, and your neighborhood is bikeable, mm -hmm. even moderately bikeable. Right. You you change that that gap between the the one mile walk right. and the five mile drive. Yep. You you close that completely. Exactly. Because a bike you can go two miles, three miles, four miles, five miles right. very easily and you don't need you need some infrastructure right. and cities certainly need to look at the uh, what I would just think of as like the pinch points, the danger points, right? right? But most streets are very, if, you, if you're driving, especially if you've got traffic going this speed, which is really yeah. friendly for cycling, you can bike right in the street, like it's not a big deal. And I was gonna say, that is exactly what um, has happened here. And you'll notice uh, we've got a lot of uh, a traffic calming elements to these streets with, uh, I would guess that these uh, uh, cafe, uh, dining areas were probably the result, and they're very formalized. You'll notice that in the city, they all look exactly the same. Oh, really? And so it okay. looks like it was probably a, po a, COVID, uh, a COVID pandemic, yeah, yeah. but it's done a wonderful job of really creating a calm street environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't been out riding yet, but I know that it's gonna be fine because I, you know, I spent the last three or four days here, and. And there's just no traffic. Right. I mean. No, the traffic yeah. is very low, but yeah. that's not, I mean, in, in, in most cities, yeah. traffic's very yeah. low yeah. in the city center. Yeah, we yeah, were in Oklahoma like, City and we're like, there's, no traffic there's massively all. wide streets yeah, and there's no lanes, traffic. There's yeah. No traffic. Yeah. But I mean, you, you look at this and I think part of what calms things is that unlike in Oklahoma City, you actually have people. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. We, you're driving down here and everyone who drives is aware that there's lots of humans on the side. Yeah. And so when you're aware that there's humans on the side, this is that stupid debate I've been having with people on Twitter. Yeah. There's some people who are like, every driver is a sociopath ready to kill you. Right. Like they're all like, they don't care about you. Right. And I'm like, if there are humans walking on a sidewalk, that calms traffic even on a horrible street. Right. Because people do not want to hit people. Right. And if there's a lot of people like this and then a lot of complexity, right. I mean, look at, you, you've got plants, you've got trees, you've got like barriers between, you've got parked cars. The driver starts to think in their mind, like subtly, there's a lot of stuff going on here. I can't predict everything in this environment. And so I'm going to slow down. 
you add a thing like a speed hump like this, yeah. and I mean, I, I don't, do they need that here? Maybe, maybe this was a spot where things were opening up and they were seeing it. But well, I think, I think what's like, really interesting is, I'm glad you, you mentioned this speed hump. I've uh -huh. watched it perform in the early morning uh, when I've gone out for coffee. And um, what's really nice about this is it, it's indicative of the fact that they know that these mid-block crossings yeah. are, so they're encouraging That's the mid-block mid, mid -block crossing. Maybe it's more of a mid-block yeah. crossing than yeah, an actual yeah. speed hump. Because yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, I don't know as you need, I mean, to me, mm -hmm. I, it doesn't feel like you need a speed hump here, but the mid-block yeah. crossing, you yeah. certainly do, Yeah. right? Yeah. Well, we, can, we, can we, were, we were talking about electric assist bikes, Yeah. and I gotta tell you, I've tried a couple, like yeah. they're fantastic, they're yeah. amazing. I don't have one. I think I would feel guilty getting one because everything is so close. Like I like I like right. if <laughs> my grocery store is a mile away. Yeah. I bike to the grocery store. The only reason I could maybe justify electric assist is certainly not for the because I live in a very flat city as right, well. Right, right. Yeah. It's not it's not the biking, it would be the hauling, right? right. Yes. Like I could see that. Yes. But I mean Yes. We're getting down to just being my wife and I at home. I don't know, you and Chris, Not yeah, home. I mean, you, get, you two could have like a little date night, yeah, right? You know, get on true. the back or that's get true. in the front. You that's know? true, she would make me sit in back. <laughs> um, let's let's uh, go this way a little bit. I want to show you some more stuff. I'm pausing here, Chuck, just to point out this really cool oh, yeah. little alley. So there's, there's a whole network of alleys here. Some of them have been activated, some of them not. But it, again, just like tapping into some you know, creative ways that you know, we, we kind of forgot. We forgot, you know, really. Well, so, yeah. so you're right. Okay, I like it, right? Like it, it has some, it would be really nice if the electric lines ran down there. Yeah. If you had, you know, I mean, an alley is for the things that you don't want. Right. Yeah. And we put a lot of the things that we don't want out yeah. here to compete with everything else. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, really good point. But, good. Yeah. you know, I, I think as opposed to like not maintaining it or not, yeah. you know, you can see this is, a, I'm, I'm guessing that is like original yeah. block. Cool look. You know what I like? This is just because I'm a, I don't know what, I love this, um, I love this ornamentation. Yeah. I'm sure that like Edward yeah. <laughs> or would be like, oh, that's just cheesy. Maybe not, yeah. but I, I like how they painted it and I'm just like, yeah. I like how they care for this facade. Yeah. But yeah, man, no, that's probably newer. Yeah, yeah. you do have a vehicle right there for you. So. No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. The second year, yeah. I would have hired Here, I'm, I'm checking out the sidewalks. Yeah. I'm checking out the blocks. Oh, yeah. did I scare him off? <laughs> He's like, oh, that's where I wasn't supposed to go. Anyway. These, um, yeah. it, it, it looks older. I don't think it is. I think that they've gone in and replaced it and put it back in. It's old-ish, but certainly not original. Uh-huh. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. This is awesome. I mean, these, these buildings here are just fantastic. It, it's funny because when you come when you come east, and you've got to see this too from Austin mm -hmm. or from Boulder, right? Yeah, yeah. You come out east, and the stuff that they're like, this is just our throwaway junk. Like, yeah. we don't, this neighborhood's okay, but it's not great. Right. People would drive two hours to be, if you had like two blocks of this in Minnesota, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. people would drive for hours to just like hang out in this space. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because we have such a dearth of it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't mature enough after World War II, so we, right. we tore down what was there. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, this was mature enough that they kept it, or yeah. a lot of it. So the reason, the reason why I wanted to come uh, over to this block is so now we start to see a repetition of some uh, one-way couplets, and uh -huh. so this is another one-way street. Oh, really, John, look at all the people, though. I, I, I'm like, we, we have not walked a block yet where we haven't run into a lot of people. Yeah. And it's like, what, three in the afternoon? Yeah. I mean, you're not talking about like, you're just talking about people going about life. It's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. No, it, this it, is it, a one-way yeah. couplet, eh? Well, so yeah, so this is a one-way here. We'll run, and so this is a two-lane one-way. I, you know, I don't, 
it's it's still relatively calm, but it would be even it would be even it would be even better if it were two A. Someone someone told me someone told me recently. Have you been to Mexico City ever? I haven't been to Mexico. I haven't either. And someone told me that it's the best case argument for couplets. Mm -hmm. They said that they do them awesome there and they're okay. great yeah. and they help with traffic but they also keep things like calm and slow and like mm -hmm. they do a really good job with it. I, I most American cities, particularly as you get east, yeah. these these couplets are so unnecessary. Yeah, and I, mean, I just don't understand it. Yeah, I mean really what we end up seeing here is is high just speed. the fact that it's it's a higher speed, comfortable environment. If you have that fri friction of going, you know, one in each direction, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what you've done is you've just given people more margin of error yeah. while they drive. Yeah. And engineers think when you give people more margin of error, traffic flow improves. Yeah. I, like, okay, but traffic flow improves, speeds go up, right. and the collisions you have are more dangerous, more kinetic energy, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it's just not a plus you're solving a problem that doesn't exist. Right, yeah. Oh my gosh, we gotta have traffic flow. There's no freaking traffic. Right. There's no traffic. Right. Like, what are, we, what are we solving? So getting back to the book, uh, and we start thinking about what we're walking through this in terms like of, of, of housing. A big portion of what you're saying in the book is that we need to be thickening up our housing stock and we need to be doing this at a scale that, and you mentioned it earlier, you can't just rely on big projects. Yeah. And a big part of that is, is, is the fact that it would never, it's never gonna be able to scale up. So we really have yeah. to get the policies in place so that we can, you know, Release the swarm of, yeah, yeah. of home building. Yeah, that's Daniel's term, which yeah. I think is a great one. Yeah. You, you, there's a recognition, and we spend a lot of time in the book talking about the, the finance of housing. And I think, I hope people who read that come away with a recognition that the financial markets dominate what is being built. Right. What is being built is not, the, what, what are the new urbanists like insights and it's like this frustration that they have is every time we build new urbanist stuff, it sells like immediately. Right. People pay a premium. They want to live there. Why don't we build more of this? Yeah. And the reason is because we're not building because things that people want. We're building things that people can finance. Right. We're building things that banks are able to write mortgages for, sell off on secondary markets, have them bundled with other similar products, have those, uh, bet on, hypothecated, uh, you know, traded, swapped, optioned. These are financial products. And if you recognize that, you'll recognize that none of the market mechanisms that bring those things to bear will destroy themselves. Right. It, no one's going to lend out so much money that we build so many five over ones that five over ones prices crash. Because as soon as the market starts to soften, the banks pull back and like we're not lending on that now till the market comes back. Right, right. So by, by, go, by saying we have these two products we can build, single family homes or duplexes on the one hand in like new greenfield developments or big infill massive buildings, mm -hmm. those are it. That's like all we got on the table. What you are saying is that you will always be at the whim of the financial markets. Right, yeah. We have to build a different style of unit, finance in a different way. And that means filling in those gaps we just walked by, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it means saying, like those gaps right now that our people are parking on or not doing anything with, that should be housing. Right. When we get out of the neighborhoods where the building's a little less intense, there's all kinds of gaps, all kinds of space yeah. for people to build stuff. And we struggle to get it permitted. We struggle to uh, get it uh, developers to build it and we struggle to get it financed right. and in all three of those things local governments cities local philanthropy can play a huge role in getting those entry-level units built right and if we can that is something we can flood the market with yeah. and if we flood the market with cheap affordable units everything above that price point is going to be anchored at a lower price point yeah 
I, I use the analogy of shoes. If the only shoes that we could buy today were like Gucci, high-end Gucci sandals and Air Jordans, and if you wanted shoes but you couldn't afford that, you had to wait till someone like phased out of their shoes and you could buy an old ratty pair of shoes someday. Right, yeah. We would be stuck in this market where those shoes were overly, yeah. overly, va you know, overly valued, like yeah. overly yeah. priced. Yeah. But if we were able to, uh, you know, build, make a penny loafer, right. you change the market completely because not everybody can get into a shoe. And now you're not working from a place of scarcity, right. you're working from a place of abundance. Yeah. And then prices will become locally responsive. Yeah. That's what, what we have today is prices that are responsive to financial macro markets, right. not to local supply and demand. Wow, okay, this is very nice. Dude, I like this. So this is my little coffee shop here on the corner over by the swimming pool. This is you, you, really You may nice. not even notice the swimming no, pool. No, I saw it. Was yeah. We turned, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, look at that. Yeah. So, so what we start to see is, you know, <laughs> we start to see a fair amount of, of pride, you know, coming back oh, yeah. to the community and to what we, we have, you know, in place here. And yeah, I think it's just, well, I, th I, I think w one of the things that I loved about your book is, is like, let's, let's try to break down these barriers that are preventing homeowners and incremental developers from just being able to do what you said back there, which is let's fill in some of these gaps. Let's, let's you know, paint some paint. Let's, you know, there's no reason why this should have been a through street, so let's get rid of this as a through street and turn it into... Or, or, or recognize that it has higher value as something else, exactly. right? Yeah. Like, we have an abundance of through streets yeah. and a lack of places. Yeah. And we can actually turn one of these into a place. And the thing I like about this is it's a place that has some meaning built into it. I mean, I'm, yeah. I've been here all of 60 seconds, and I can see how we're telling local stories of local people in a way that I'm, I'm, I'm guessing is very meaningful to people who are here. Right. And that's what building a place is about. Yeah, yeah. Now we, we, we heard a, a very, very loud motorcycle going by and we haven't been completely assaulted by the noise associated with motor vehicles, but every once in a while when you do hear a, you know, a slow moving noisemaker like that, yeah. uh, you, it reminds you that, oh yeah, cities aren't inherently noisy and, you know, and noise polluting, it's, it's the motor vehicles that make it so. Yeah. Um, that was one of the things in COVID, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, it really, I, I live in a small town and it is quiet. Yeah. When we moved into the city seven, eight years ago, that was one of the biggest concerns my wife had, yeah. was we're gonna move from this quiet place on a yeah. five acre lot out in the country yeah. into the middle of town. Uh, it's quieter in town. Yeah. Yeah. Because where we were, there was a highway, yeah. like a quarter mile away. Yeah. And even though we couldn't see it, and there was a lot of woods. Plus, right? Right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the friction noise, I mean, that yeah. yeah that was loud. loud. Yeah. And in town, it's really yeah. quiet in our neighborhood. I have to laugh because the, I, I don't know if you remember me co commenting on your, uh, your YouTube video when you ran into your mom uh, <laughs> out there. I was yeah. like, I was literally thinking during that, that video, there's just nobody around. So you're, you're producing these, these short walk around, yeah. you know. I walk talking, to work. Yeah, you walk to, to work. and you talk, and I love and it. They're brilliant, yeah. it's brilliant. And there's, there's never nobody anybody there. around. Uh, it's a small town and nobody walks. But I ran into my mom coming out of church, yeah. getting into her car to go back to the farm. Yeah, so, so yeah, she's I pretty mean, far out, yeah. Yeah, no, she's yeah. three miles away. Yeah. But right when COVID happened, mm -hmm. All my friends started to tell me, like, I can't believe how quiet it is here. Right. Yeah. And then you heard, like, people started to talk about it online. Right. It, it, it was like, it's astounding how quiet it is. Yeah. And I, I think even I was surprised. Yeah. The background noise that is automobiles. Right. And how that affects you. Right. I got a pair of noise-canceling headphones. 
I use them on airplanes because I fly a lot. Right, right. And I, I, I got these, and I, I did not get them for an airplane. I got them to get nice headphones. Right. And I put them on on the plane. I will not fly without them now. Oh, I mean, they, they completely change the experience yes. of flying. Yes. But you don't. I never realized how assaulted I was with noise right. on a plane until I had the noise canceling headphones. Yeah. And I do think that cities have a little bit of that same thing. Right. When you're near the traffic and the traffic becomes like a background hum, right. it's just like a constant agitation. Right. And I see it when like I go to the big city with my dad, right? Like I take my dad who lives on a farm right. to the big city, he would say. Yeah. <laughs> And he's, is so much for him, it's like overwhelming. Right. A lot of it is just that background hum. Yeah. It's that background, there's, there, yeah. there isn't the peace. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was interesting too, because we heard a, a, a like a, a utility tractor, a gator went by, it was quite noisy. Mm -hmm. Then we had a silver se sedan go by, and it was quite quiet. We'll see, we see that he, we also have a mid-block crossing here, a raised mid-block crossing feeding into this open space, this public open space. And so there is that traffic calming aspect. I didn't hear the silver car at all. We've got a birdie right behind you just chirping away. Yeah. It's like this backdrop yeah. to this. Yeah. I mean, well, this is what we can do. I mean, laughing. yeah, and kids laughing. Yeah. Um, so so when we, we talk about density being this scary thing, it's right. But then when you spend time in a place where there's a richness of shops, housing above, you know, a park here, a pool, kids living yeah. here, it, yeah. it's like, it, I, think, I think people are, it's starting to change that people are, their perceptions of, of what this is. Yeah. And I think there is a little bit of a longing to be able to, hey, let's, let's get rid of these codes and these laws that make building this impossible and then while we're at it let's not let's not you know feed it with you know autocentric infrastructure i feel like there's two things there the first one is the idea that people would like to live in a place like this mm -hmm. i think it's interesting to note that a lot of the people who make that decision mm -hmm. don't live in places like this right. and i can't tell you how many times i've been at a planning commission meeting or a council meeting where they'll say, well, people, and, and John, it's all over the map. It depends right. on where you go. You go to the East Coast Lake where I, where I used to live when I yeah. was an engineer and my yeah, wife yeah. and I built a house in the middle yeah. of the woods. For them, less than a five acre lot was urban. Right. And they were like, who would, who would want to live on a one acre lot? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And for them, it's like, we can't allow something that dense. That's right. crazy. Yeah. And then I move into town where it's a 25 foot lot you know, yeah. and they're like, well, who would ever live on a 20 foot lot? Like yeah. You, yeah. you you, can't do that. Like we yeah. can't, you should have two of these 25 foot lots to build a house. Right. And I go to a, a larger city and they're like, who would want eight units an acre? Like right. that's, that's crazy, that, that density is crazy. Yeah. And you, you realize when you hear all those conversations that it's someone who has anchored their own current status and position at right. a place yeah. and said like anything beneath that is unacceptable. Right. Sometimes they'll say unacceptable because we don't want the people who would be different than me. Right. Sometimes it's unacceptable because they actually think, boy, that would not be very kind. That would right. not be very nice. Right, right. Um, the reality is, is when you build stuff like this, there's a lot of people who would love to live here. Yeah. And I think if we can't open our minds and our hearts to that, we're missing a lot. Yeah. And two things really come to mind is that a lot of the, the resistance that you know, comes from trying to add more housing, thickening up the, the housing stock is back to what we had talked about earlier, which is a fear of induced car traffic and, and you know, where are they going to park and, and all these, there's, there's this, you know, assumption that everyone is going to come with an automobile, you know, almost like wearing a coat of car. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the reality is how we have to manage that before we manage the people. Yeah, right. and, and it's yeah. one of the, the interesting things, too, because you, you mentioned it, I, I think I uh, may have mentioned it already, is that in a couple different places in the book, you really talk about it's not just about building housing anywhere. We've got to get the housing in the right places, too. 
and we got to do it at scale. We got to really, you know, open up the floodgates so that people can do this on their own because it has to be a bottom-up revolution from that standpoint. And all the more that it is in an environment where people don't have to, you know, every trip isn't a car trip. Right. They can walk, they right. can bike, they can jump on a trolley, they can, you know, take transit. Right. We, ha we, we have to allow neighborhoods to thicken up and evolve. Yeah. And we can do that in a way that is much, has much, much less friction than it does today. Yeah. If you look at, like, this street here, yeah. And you say, what, what zoning code would produce this? Really, it's very, very simple. I mean, for this street, you would need a build two line. Yeah. Uh, you would need a, a, probably like a height requirement. You know, you wouldn't go to the moon. You would have a, yeah. you, I wrote an ordinance years ago and, and the Yimby people freaked out because I said I would, I would make the height like one and a half times what the largest like adjacent building was. Yeah. So you had things, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make sure that the buildings respect the other buildings around them right. uh, from a design standpoint. But really, a one-page code that said, build to this line, yeah. have some symmetry in your building, have some opacity on your first floor, and you know, don't be a tower over everybody else. Yeah. And you come in tomorrow and want to build that building, and we'll do it. Yeah. Now, you've got some building code things when you run buildings next to each other. Yeah. You've got fire code issues and other things. But the reality is, in most, in most development in the US that is not urban like this, right. You're talking about places where you've got 20 feet between buildings. Yeah. You, you, from a fire code standpoint, five feet is plenty, right? right? Uh, you've got large setbacks. You don't need that. You've got large backyards. You can put housing in there and fill that in. So for 95% for of where we have invested public infrastructure, built roads, built sewer systems, built water systems, you could 5X the housing. Right with relatively no public investment yeah. and relatively no uh, difficulty or even stress. Right. I don't even think you would have parking problems in most of these places. Yeah. So I, I'm assuming that when all of this was built, yeah. built, there weren't even codes in place. No, but what there was, was a cultural understanding of how you build things. Right. And I think that is, that there's people who want to do away with all codes and I actually think that they're discounting the role of culture. Right. Um, and I don't mean culture like we all go to church. I mean yeah. culture like, uh, how are you going? Yeah, good. I mean culture like, you know, if, if you're gonna build a building, here's how you build it. And if you don't build it this way, right. uh, you will, like, it, what, what your store will be shunned, you will be shunned. Like, it just is not gonna work. Right. Plus, <laughs> I point out a lot in environments like this. If you come and build, I mean, pick your building. Yeah. Let's say you're the last building here to be built. Let's say you come in here and you're gonna build. Yeah. And you're the most selfish, self-centered, I don't care about anyone but myself. I'm gonna build this building. It's 1915 or whatever, and I'm gonna go build my own building. Right. How would you do it to maximize your own value, yeah. your own worth? Well, you would build in line with everybody else. Right. You would build the building at roughly the height of everyone else. Right. You would front Here, the, on. you know, you would have the door fronting the street. Yeah. You would have, uh, you know, nice windows so people could look in. Yeah. You, you, you would do all these things that made your building kind of socially kind to every other building around it. Right, right. If you come in today and you say, our building culture, we're gonna build a new building here, what would you do? Right. You would make it the most obnoxious thing you could, you'd have right. the biggest sign you could, yeah. you would try to make it stand out and, and be, you'd have a bit, you'd tear down the building next to you to have a parking lot, to have right. easy, you'd have a drive-through. Yeah. Yeah. It, we, we have gone from an evolved wisdom on how to build right. that needed to be, in a sense, socially kind to everyone, right. because right. that's how everyone thrived. Right, right to a style of building that is socially adversarial yeah. because the way you get ahead is by stomping on someone else. Right. And, and we've lost that institutional knowledge yes. of, you know, that's passed down 
from generation to generation. I wanted to pause here because I wanted to point I out. I thought you were going to make me ride the lime scooter. No, no, no. We're gonna, not going to do that. Although my my <laughs> ankle would probably or my foot would probably appreciate that. But I wanted to point out cultural institutions we just mentioned. We can see the steeple here. Um, I was able to go up oh, high. Sure. I was able to go up high on a building and look down on this whole developed area, and you see all sorts of steeples, and so you see you know, those types of institutions that have continued to survive, you know, in this area. I, I went to church this morning. There you go. At the, yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a Catholic oh, cathedral. cathedral. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what, yeah. what a beautiful building. Yeah. And as I understand it, there's a, there's a, 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 a wonderful Jewish uh, church right there too, sure. um, near the cathedral. Synagogue? Yeah, synagogue. Uh-huh. There you go. <laughs> yeah. They had a, they had a, a replica of the Pieta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, what a marvelous building. Yeah. I mean, yes, so the, these institutions, um, the great thing about a city this mature mm -hmm. is that those things were so great by the time you got to it right. that they didn't dare tear them down. Right. Sometimes they built highways right next to them and yeah. did disservice to them, yeah. but this city doesn't seem to have done that as much as yeah. other places I've right. seen. And so we're back here on another of the, the couplets, the one-way couplets. When you said institutions, I thought you were meeting the barbershop. Well, well that too. Yeah. Which is probably like a nice third-place institution. That is kind of a third-place institution, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, this couplet is, it, you can just see that they are less friendly and less, um, and I just, I don't, yeah. I don't get it. I mean, this, this street, it just doesn't make sense. From a yeah. design standpoint, yeah. this street is not much different than the really nice one two blocks over. Right. Yeah. But the couplet does change more than subtly the dynamics of the street. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And, and you, it, this is fine to walk down. It's a very nice street. It's very comfortable. But it does not feel as nice and comfortable as the other one, even right. though yeah. I think in many ways this has better buildings. Right. This is over the Rhine, huh? Over the Rhine. So was they called the canal the Rhine, like a German thing? Yeah, yeah. So the Germans that settled here back in the mid 1980 or 1880s, yeah. and uh, as I understand, the population, the neighborhood, really started to um, kind of disintegrate and go downhill um, after World War One because of the cultural. Uh, challenges with uh, the, the fact that is with it's a it was a German settled really? area. Yeah, it's so interesting yeah. because we did go through this cultural, yeah. um, you know, in a sense, distrust of Germans. Yeah, and I don't know if you know this, but I am I am uh, a little over fifty percent Norwegian. Right. My mom's side was hundred percent Norwegian. My dad's side was this combination of Prussian, uh -huh. which is German, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and a little bit of Norwegian and, and some other stuff. But yeah. that, that grandma, grandpa were German for right. the most part. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, you get a little bit. By the time World War II came around and my grandfather was, went to the Pacific, the, I don't think the family was like very German. And what they were, they tried to... You know, like they, that was, there was never anything passed on to me yeah. <laughs> about German heritage. Right, 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 yeah. Uh, on the other side, Norwegian, there was an attempt to pass on a, a modest amount to me. Right. Well, and that's such a, a, a cultural, the Norwegian uh -huh. cultural institution that is Minneapolis. Yeah, that's it's, true. it's like it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it is <laughs> well, that was always my diversity joke. Yeah. <laughs> we have all kinds of diversity. Yeah. In my hometown, we have. Uh, Nor we have Swedes and Norwegians and Finns. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> All different forms of Scandinavian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it always got a good laugh. Yeah, yeah. And disarmed the crowd when I was getting the difficult yes. uh, racial questions yeah, that I, I, I struggle to answer. Yeah. We are, we're now on uh, 12th Street. This is another uh, couplet, right? Uh, yeah, this is so the other. This is the other uh, is the couplet we that we were on before. Look at those murals, though. My God. Yeah. So murals are all over the city. Yeah, they um, really I've, a lot of I've that. probably taken taken photographs of uh, probably 30 or 40 murals so far. Um, this is also the like this is also the the tram line. Oh, okay. So you've seen the tram go through. So this is on uh, 12th Street. This it's a big the, loop. This is so. the. This was a controversial project that yeah. they. Yeah. I, I remember all the debate around it, yeah. and 
I might have said something not friendly. As I as I understand, it's it it, it doesn't really go necessarily anywhere super super um, yeah. meaningful. Yeah. It is kind of seen as a. a a wonderful amenity for tourism and supporting tourism and supporting yeah. people coming into the city for the ballparks yeah. and all of that. Yeah. But I can tell you this, I wrote it with our good friend Bernice oh, okay. Okay. Um, on Monday afternoon and we were riding it with a full full tram yeah. and you know, 100% local people. Yes. I mean, these are people okay, catching a ride, really, yeah, okay. getting home. Okay, okay, so they were doing so. functional things with it. Yeah. I've been to the one in Memphis and that one makes me kind of sad too. Uh, because, you know, Memphis has so many desperate needs yeah. and often they're given silver bullet projects that don't humbly observe where people struggle and start with that. Right. And they, they yeah. try to like, let's get the moonshot thing we can do. Right. And I feel like their trolley system is a little bit of that. Yeah. Where it is a wish that someone else would come in and be part of our community right. as opposed to like serving the people who are there. Right. This felt like it rhymed with that, right. but I'm happy to hear that locals are using it. Yeah. Well, and I think part, partly too, we're, with, we, we're seeing some of these older abandoned buildings being brought back to life and uh -huh. people are, are starting to live here once again. Yeah. There's a certain amount of vitality and vibrancy that's coming yeah. back yeah. to this area. Yeah. Let's go ahead and walk uh, down this way a couple okay. blocks and get you back. We're at your place again. We're at my place again. So, do you go to Taste of Belgium yet? yet? Uh, last night. Oh, was it yeah. nice? Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it was a nice little place. I think um, I had, uh, you know, the, I was like really pushing the edges of culinary stuff. I had French fries and <laughs> Brussels sprouts. So you were, <laughs> you were vibing so, the way I do. Yeah. All different kinds of hot dogs. Yeah, and, um, and so folks who are watching this, yes, we're, we're, we're just crossing because that's the way I ride my bike oh, and no, that's, that's the, the way, way that I, I cross things. is it if I look Jay Walkers and, and are see, heroes yeah thank you very much uh -huh. we just saw a, a really nice gazelle um, I think that was a gazelle okay um, a bike? bike yeah okay Go you're by. talking bike like yeah. you said gazelle and the yeah. first thing in my mind was <laughs> <laughs> there's like where, zoo where? animals here like where do we see that <laughs> you're like where <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, Your bike culture. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Dutch brand. I bought my bike, bike like so, yes. five, <laughs> I bought my bike like 10 years ago yeah. from a guy for 120 bucks. Yeah. He said it was a nice bike. Yeah. It, it works. Yeah. <laughs> Here's, I think, a closer to what some of the original yeah, cobbles this is were what, probably right, like. Right, right. Yeah. That other stuff looked like it was. Yeah. And yeah. then when we got up, I'm like, I yeah. don't think so. Yeah, yeah. But this is that's yeah. actual stones. Actual, yeah. Yeah. actual stones. So I was gonna say something about creative class. Yeah. Cause I, I do, I, I like Richard Florida. I find his insights to be really great. I, I, I think he's a very smart guy. I do think though, obviously, he comes from. Oh, how do we say this kindly? Like a, 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 a train of thought that is separate from the human condition. <laughs> that's, a, that's a fancy way. It's an elite way of saying elitist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, I like him a lot. And yeah. I, I do think that his heart is in the right place. And I yeah. see him like struggle with some of the implications of what I think he kind of joyously called the creative class. Like, right. look at, look, I grew up with cities that were in decline. Nobody wanted to live in them. Now people are moving back. Let me describe how this is happening and isn't it great? Right, yeah. And then it became too much of a good thing. Right. I, I, I think that cities that try to get that, that hipster vibe yeah. before they take care of their own people yeah. uh, wind up doing an injustice to their people, right? right? And I think they wind up actually falling short yeah. of what they could otherwise be. Yeah. Well, um, and, and talk a little bit about that too, because you're uh, one of the, the the key premises of Strong Towns and of the book that is you know constantly there. And you mentioned it earlier. Yeah. Was um, you know do that small do little that thing, thing, that yeah. next thing. Where are people hurting? What do they really need? So I was at a conference once, and before I was about to go on, the person who was organizing it says, I really love your stuff and it's great, but these people need to know. They need, a, they need at least one slide in there that says, when you go home, you do this. 
And I think she was hoping that I would say like, go home and plant five trees or go home and put in this crosswalk. Yeah. But what I did, what I came up with, yeah. <laughs> hi. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what I did, what I came up with was this four step approach. And it's right. something we had talked about internally, like in a rough sense, mm -hmm. but I actually put it on a slide. Yeah. And you know, cause you give presentations too, you go through and then I got to this slide and I'm doing it for the first time. And I was in a room of a few hundred people. All of a sudden, John, yeah. everybody's phone came out. Yeah. They started photographing this yeah. slide and I'm like, okay, oh, wow. I, yeah. I, I, hit, I hit on yes. something yeah. very raw. <laughs> this idea of how do we determine the project that we should do. Yeah. And when I look at the streetcar go by, I realized that somebody really wanted a streetcar mm -hmm. and they thought we could go get a federal grant and put in the streetcar and wouldn't it be great? And I'm not even gonna argue that it's not great or we shouldn't have done it, right? right. right. But the four step process and the Strong Downs approach in general says, start with what people urgently need. Right. Where are people struggling? Yeah. Where are they having a hard time doing yeah. the next thing? Yeah. And, then and, I guarantee, and I guarantee you in this neighborhood, oh, yeah. One Lots of the things of that they needed was a, 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 a park. Sure. Because right. this yep. is a, a relatively recent yeah. uh, you know, transformation. I, I love how yeah. this centers on this street and they got the geometry of this yeah. really well. Yeah. But the idea is how do we then do that next thing? Yeah. And instead of waiting for the grant to come through or the big project to come through or the cap on permits plan to come through, you go out and you take the stuff you have on hand and you do it. Yeah. I. I I know Barka Patel's story. Mm -hmm. We featured her in a bunch of things. Yep. But watching her yesterday do the keynote at the gathering, it, it blew me away. And there were things that I did not, had not put together in her story. Eight years. Right. In eight years. And she started with going and getting golf, uh, not golf, tennis court paint. Right that was like you left over that they weren't using yeah. and started putting that down on streets. Yeah. Not the right color, not the right style, yeah. not gonna, you know, but like this is what we got. It's surplus, yeah. Yeah, and so yeah. I, if this is all I got, I can go make streets safer with this. Yeah. And I'm like, that is what we're all about. Like take what you have on hand, yeah. go out and like fix things. Right. And I think a lot of times our professional class, of which I am part of, so I'm, yeah. you know, but my fellow engineers, my fellow planners, we can only think in terms of big things. Right. The way you go about fixing this, there was a crash the other day. It was the third crash this year. Mm -hmm. In the same spot, hit a building right. in an intersection yeah. in Long Beach, California. The city said it will take $25 million to fix this. Right. $25 million means you're gonna redo everything. Right and we're gonna wait and let cars continue to crash in until yeah. we get the money to redo everything. Yeah. Go put up some bollards, right. go put up a Jersey barrier, yeah. go use some paint to narrow up the lane, slow traffic down coming in. There's a million things you can do with like the stuff you got in surplus. Right. And this is I think where we fall short is that it's great to have Daniel Burnham's vision, make no little plans. Yeah. And I, I, I will not criticize someone for having big dreams and making big plans. Right. But if we don't take the next step, if we don't act with the things we have today, right. you're gonna spend your whole career, you're gonna spend your whole life yeah. just like waiting for the big plan to come and you're gonna be disappointed by it. Yeah. One of the things that I love about, you know, what we've seen, you know, here in Cincinnati, walking around here in the Over the Rhine district, we're at the music hall in a beautiful old historic this building is here. Is I you mean, can tell, gems. yeah, and, and what I really love about this too is you're also looking at what you already have in terms of your assets. You look across the way here at this park and you see a couple that have been fixed up and a couple that still need to be fixed yeah, up. Yeah. And what are we doing to you know make it easier for that incremental developer uh -huh. to be able to streamline, show some, to show some love to that, bring it back. Whoever designed this park yeah. was very genius. Yeah. This park has great symmetry. Mm -hmm. It really, um, when I say symmetry, I mean walking through it, you're, you're comforted the entire way. And what it does is because of that strong symmetry, it draws out the other stuff around it. Right. It actually accents this building. It accents those buildings out there. It makes them part of like this, uh, this installation. And it's yeah. really, it's very powerful. This is a, 
I wonder if they do like bands and stuff here. I mean, it's got that kind of feel to it. Right. Like come and hang out in the park. Yeah. Uh, this is just very well done. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. I'm I'm impressed. I did not know this was here. So I'm I'm fulfilling my role of of knowing you now for well over a decade, and uh, and I say fulfilling my role because. A decade ago, uh, this month, uh, we were in San Antonio, and oh. uh, we had a really rough uh, couple days in San Antonio. It was fun, but it was it was it was rough. It was challenging. It was challenging. I have good memories oh, of yeah. that. Yeah. Because the people were very receptive. They were. Yeah. But the cognitive dissonance between what they viewed the world as yep. and what the world actually was yep. was a cha was challenging. Yep. And the other thing that's challenging for you is your time is in such demand um, <laughs> yeah, the, that yeah, sure. you, you, you don't see very much more than the inside of a hotel room Often, and yeah. off to this event and then that event, yeah. and et cetera. Yeah. What did I do for you? Oh, man. Well, I, I, have, a, I have a completely different view of Cincinnati now. Yeah. And you know? what did I do for you in San Antonio? No, I have a completely different view of San Antonio. You took yeah. me to some yeah. neighborhoods. We, we walked Boom. around and I saw some things that I would otherwise yeah. not have seen. Yeah. And I, I, that is true. I, I had a, a view of Cincinnati that was not poor. Right. And you made it even better than it was. Yeah. My view of San Antonio was poor and you gave me hope. Yeah. So yes, we're and literally uh, what I'm we grateful did for the, both was, of those. Literally what we did was, was get a couple blocks off of a strode uh -huh. into a leafy neighborhood. Yeah. The temperature immediately went down. Yeah. <laughs> because that was like May 5th or May 6th, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, 10 years ago, yeah. 2014. And you commented right away, you're like, oh my gosh, the temperature just went down. Yeah, no, <laughs> my you remember blood, that? Yeah, you, yeah, it's like your stress melted away. Well, okay, I am a Minnesotan. <laughs> yes. So Texas is very hot for me. Yes. <laughs> uh, and we were, I was in the monkey suit then yeah, too. Yeah. So we were walking and I'm like, this is oppressive heat, but I'm yeah. doing this for you, John. Yeah. And then we did just walk into this, this it was just street trees, but yeah. they were old trees. Right in an old neighborhood, and they, um, they did have this calming, peaceful effect, yeah. and then just dramatically lowered the temperature. Yeah. And I gotta tell you, I've, I've, I've felt that effect, you know, where I'm from a little bit, but I had never felt it that way. Yeah. It was pronounced. I mean, it had to be, it had to be eight, 10 degrees of Fahrenheit difference. Yeah. Between did did you two. notice it today when we were going oh, through yeah, some a of the little trees, bit. the steep yeah, streets no, of that, absolutely. Uh, street trees? Yeah. But it was, um, you know, you, you recognize, Joe has this thing, he ran into this engineer who was like, I don't, we don't have any street trees in our city because they attack the sidewalks. Right. And he's made it into a joke, right? Like, you know, a nightmare on Elm Street or something where like the trees are actually <laughs> <try> assaulting <laughs> the sidewalks. Um, I gotta love Joe. <laughs> I love Joe. He can take anything and make it just way more fun. Yeah. But the reality is, is street trees are like the most human thing you can do. Yeah. I get the nature part of it. They suck up water. In Minnesota, they actually catch snow and aspire it mm -hmm. so that you actually have less snow to shovel on the right. ground. Yeah. It's funny, the, the engineers are like, we can't have tree trees. We gotta have some place to clear the snow. And I'm gonna have a lot less snow to clear if you put in the trees. Right, yeah. So it's this, you know, tug back and forth. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, the most humane thing you can do in a city is put trees. Yeah. The smartest thing you can do economically is plant trees. Right. Every tree you plant. Joe has this thing he does, and I think he's, <laughs> I love, I mean, I love, 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 love Joe. But Joe's taking, he takes the, like, the cost of doing stormwater and extrapolates it out to like, if you have so many trees, you have so much less cost. In a lot of places, the stormwater is like a sunk cost. Right. So you can't really, like if you were building a city from scratch, that would all be true. But like here, you've got storm drains, right? right. Like you've got, it's a sunk cost. And so saying you can have a smaller storm drain if you have a tree, yeah. it doesn't really matter because the storm drain's already here. Yeah. Right, you can't rip it up and like undo that investment. But a street tree makes these buildings more valuable. Right. It makes the land more valuable. If you go out and plant a street tree, you're gonna spend 75, 150, $500 on a big, nice tree, whatever it is. 
and you're gonna get way more tax revenue back than that. Yeah. And your people will live a better life. Yep. I don't know why every city in the country does not have a tree planting program. Yeah. Go find a vacant lot on the edge of town, put in a bunch of seedlings, nurture them along. Right. When they get two, three years along, dig them up, bring them in, put them out. You can have your, 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 your people do this on their downtime, right? When your maintenance is a little bit slower, you can get this done at scale. It is the lowest cost, highest returning investment you can make, and you make people's lives better. I feel like we're getting close to where that, where the church I went to today was. Yeah. Well, I think that is the Presbyterian. Okay. Maybe there was, I was walking on my, my GPS and I got, I got close to this church and I'm like, is that it? It doesn't look like what I thought it would look like, but it was certainly churchy. <laughs> and then I got up to the front door and it was a Presbyterian. Okay. And the Catholic one was on the same block, but on the back side. Okay. All right. And I'm like, well, we can all live together. There you go. Yeah. Side by side. <laughs> so in Cincinnati, all the, in Cincinnati, we all gather together. So when you, when we've been walking around here today, obviously this is a very urban environment. Um, this is, you know, this is how we built cities, you know, back in the day. And it, and it gradually grew to this level of intensity. Let's just, to wrap up the book, talk a little bit about the single family home conundrum and how we can try to add a little bit of gentle density to that environment and what, what some strategies are for, for cities. And, and I guess, you know, also throw in like your pitch, why people should uh, get the book. Do you, do you want a happy version or a challenging version? Whatever you think is gonna inspire people to buy your book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to satisfy your, your publisher here. Are you? Okay, that's very kind of you. Um, the book is a bestseller, so is, we're actually doing fine. Yeah. Um, no, so the single family home solved a problem. It solved a problem at scale at the end of World War II. It, it allowed us, I mean, culturally, recognize, there's, there's my church right over there. Yeah, there you go. Block over, it was great. This is William Henry Harrison, too. Uh, the shortest lived president. So the single family home solved this problem at the end of World War II. We could get people into places they desired. Because people, did, I mean, I think for all the urbanist rhetoric, there, there is a broad desire for having your own castle. I mean, that's always been something that rich people had, was a castle in the countryside you know, away from the city, away from everybody else. Totally get it. And we said, you know what? <clears throat> we can stay out of another Great Depression. We can do something with all these troops coming back. We'll build this new version of America and we'll create single family homes all over the place. It works really well in the first life cycle. Yeah. People get, take on mortgages, they finance the debt. Cities get all this growth, all these jobs created. You gotta go to, you know, the hardware store and get stuff for your house. So this has all these like secondary and tertiary effects. Economists talk about infrastructure as having a multiplier. What they're really saying is that at the end of World War II, when we built infrastructure, in the first life cycle, it had this massive multiplier. And they are right. What they don't talk about and what they don't calculate is that all this comes with a maintenance cost. So, Someone's got to go out and fix the road. Someone's got to go out and fix the pipe. Someone's got to go out and reside the house and put on a new roof and all that. And that has to come out of your cash. That, that's not something that when you build it, you get a mortgage for. When you buy the house, you get a mortgage. When you fix the roof, you, you got to like pay for it somehow. When you're the city and you get a new road, you get all this tax base. When you got to go out and fix the road, you don't get new tax base. Right. Okay, so cities financially are screwed. We literally have built more stuff than we have the tax base to maintain. And it really comes down to the single family home and the kind of denuded or spread out pattern of development having huge costs and not enough wealth, not enough taxable wealth tax base to actually sustain what we've built. 
as soon as you recognize that, it's a pretty easy recognition to say, well, A, a lot of stuff's gonna go away, and B, the stuff that's not gonna go away is gonna be the places where neighborhoods become more productive, right. where we make better use of the stuff we've currently built. Yeah. How do we get more homes on a street? How do we get more businesses on a block of, you know, 100 feet of pipe? How do we get more connections? How do we get more stuff? Right. The amazing thing about that is that we can actually deal with our housing problem and deal with our municipal insolvency problem. They're the same problem. Right. We can deal with them at the same time in the same way. Yes. We gotta build a bunch of stuff. And we have to build a bunch of stuff because our cities are broke and they need more tax base on their existing system. Yeah. yeah. We also need to build a lot of stuff because we don't have enough housing. And we don't have enough housing at entry level price points. Right. And so by going out and filling in the gaps, allowing people to take that fourth bedroom that they're not using anymore because their kids don't live at home anymore and turn that into an accessory apartment, it's like a very simple thing to do. The kids used to have cars in the driveway. You can just have the renter park in the driveway now. I mean, this is not like, this is not like radical transformation in the neighborhood. Or imagine this, maybe you'll actually rent to somebody who doesn't have, doesn't a, car. have a car. Right, yeah. but I'm just saying like from a <laughs> friction standpoint, yeah, yeah. there's no friction in doing this. Yeah. Yeah. You can put in a backyard cottage. You've got a big backyard you don't want to mow. Right. Put in a cottage back there and part of it. And like have your renter do the mowing and give them a break on the rent. They'd be happy to do that. And I love the fact that, you know, you had some strategies in there that are, you know, part in, in this theme that include, like, you know, you've got somebody who is, you know, maybe a, a widower or a widow and she's, you know, oh, has yeah. excess space. How can we make it easy for them to be able well, to how bring... How can we help her stay in her home? How stay in her yeah, home? Get yes. out of her house. Yeah. How do we help her live a humane yeah. life? And one of the strategies we've taken off the table is for her to turn her excess house into cash. Right. Like, why would we do that? That's something that humans have done. I, I, my kids had, uh, I can't remember what the book was. One of the American Girl dolls had like a book series. And this one family was on, you know, run into hard times. And so they started like renting out one of their rooms. Yeah. And, and I thought like, yeah, like that's what people used to do all the time. Yeah. Like that was very, very common. You, you, you have an extra room, you need some money, uh, you know, rent it out. That's very, very common. We make that illegal today for so many weird reasons. We can solve multiple problems simultaneously by just going out and building incrementally in our existing neighborhoods. And when we do that, some neighborhoods are gonna resist. They're not gonna want it. They're gonna say like, we're not, we're not partaking, we're not doing that. I don't even wanna have that fight. Yeah. There will be other neighborhoods who will embrace it and say, we're ready to do this. We're ready to go. Let's add those more units. Let's, let's convert those single family homes into duplexes. Let's allow the corner store. Let's do these things that will make this a better neighborhood. Yeah. And when the city's trying to triage their budget, hey, we got 10 miles of road we need to maintain. We only have budget for one mile. Which one is it? Yeah. It's gotta be that one in the neighborhood that is growing and thickening up and becoming a better place. Yeah. I feel like the policies align really well when you work bottom up. Yeah. Well, sir, we are back at the hotel. We're back at, at, at the Netherland Plaza, so we should probably wrap this up and call it a day. Right. Chuck, thank you so much. Yeah. Nice to see you. It's, it's nice always to wonderful to, to you know, have an excuse to, to chat, and, uh, and I love the fact that we can chat even when we don't have an excuse and don't have a reason. <laughs> and please don't forget to pick up your copy of Escaping the Housing Trap, The Strong Town's Response to the Housing Crisis by Chuck Marone and Daniel Harrigus. I highly recommend it. And if you've enjoyed this walk and talk with Chuck Marone in the Over the Rhine district of Cincinnati, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and don't forget to ring the notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do, just navigate 
navigate over to activetowns.org and then click on the support tab at the top of the page. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in. It really means so much to me. And as we close out, I hope you enjoy the rest of the still photography that I shot while walking around the Over the Rhine district. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.